As the ball dropped on New Year's Eve last year, we had a vision for what 2020 would bring. In a matter of months, that crystal clear 2020 vision had become blurry. As our goals and hopes for the year had to be changed, people started to ask, when will we go back to normal? After all, going back to normal would solve all of our problems, right? But what if normal was broken? Let's start this year by looking at things in our life that we hope don't go back to normal. From faith to finances, from relationships to racial divide. Let's move forward instead of going back to the broken normal. Hi, my name is Josh. I want to thank you again for joining me for another study session. And if you've been following along, you know that we're in a series called Renew Normal. Now, at the beginning of 2020, when the pandemic was first kind of taking shape, a lot of us were saying things like, I wonder when we're going to get back to normal, or I can't wait until things get back to normal. We were thinking to ourselves that if things went back to normal, we wouldn't have to be dealing with what it was that we were facing. But in doing so, I wonder if we have kind of overlooked the fact that there were a lot of things that were normal, but were very broken. And are those the things that we actually want to get back to now that it seems like we're coming out of this pandemic and that we're moving towards a more um, kind of normal reality, if you will. And so this series is taking a look at some of those things that maybe shouldn't go back to normal. Things like stress and anxiety and hurry. Things like devotion. What does devotion look like and how can we maybe have a better uh, version of that? We even looked at finances as well. And so today we're going to be taking a look at the topic of racial divide. Now, I want to begin our time today by just calling out the very fact that I am a white male pastor. And so I recognize that I'm coming at this from a bit of a privileged point of view and certainly a very uh, privileged or specific perspective. I don't think that that negates the value of what I'm about to say, but I would also um, want to point out that what I have to say is very much um, my perspective and what I want to do is provide actually a lot of different resources from people of color who um, can share you know a much broader perspective a much broader spectrum of perspectives um, that come at this um, topic uh, in a lot of different ways and I also want to mention too that we may not agree with all of these different perspectives but I think in order to have a full a meaningful and deep conversation and in order for things to move forward to progress uh, it's important for us to hear all sides and to get a perspective from all different points of view as opposed to just limiting ourselves to maybe what we want to hear or what we have always heard so that's the challenge for us today and so Racial divide in this country is something that we need to speak and act out against. It's not just enough to talk about it, but it's something that we need to grow in our understanding and our awareness of how we can deepen our resolve and, and truly become what is called anti-racist. And that is the, the action or the movement against racism and racial divide and so there are three things that I want to look at specifically three ways that we can kind of renew our perspective when it comes to racial divide I think we've come a long way in this country when it comes to racial divide but I think what 2020 un unveiled for many of us is that there is still a lot of work to be done there's a lot of unrest that is right below the surface and we we saw a lot of that this past year and i think it's something that is necessary for us to talk about to work through and to continue to move forward in if we are to hope to find a better or a renewed um, normal moving forward so the things i want to look at today are history lament and listening 
So let me start with renewing our history or renewing our understanding of history. And this one can be a bit of a hot button for people because the truth of the matter is the history that we have as a nation when it comes to race is complex. It is emotionally charged. It is filled with injustices. It is filled with a lot of tragedy and sorrow. And so it's something that continues to shape us in conscious and unconscious ways. And one of the best things that we can do is study our history and really study the fullness of our history, all the, the dark corners of it as well, not just those that are presented to us in, um, in textbooks and kind of the, um, the sanitized version of history, if you will. I don't know about you, but for me, history classes in school were not all that interesting. They, they seemed very difficult for me to uh, understand and keep up with. They were boring. And a lot of times I just couldn't relate to what was being taught, um, even though it, it's important for us to understand and know our history. But as I've gotten older, I have definitely become a lot more interested in history and maybe it's because I've come to a certain age where um, I recognize that I have a place in history and that it isn't something that just is um, kind of passing me by but that I have a kind of a holy responsibility a, a great responsibility as a, as a father um, as a leader as you know a husband to um, really be aware of what kind of legacy I am leaving behind. It could also mean why things like Ancestry.com have really taken off. I think people have become more and more interested in their lineage and the history that comes along with that. And while understanding history in our families and certainly in America can be a great source of pride for many of us, Recognizing it and accepting our mistakes can help us better relate to the racialized landscape that we find ourselves in. We need to understand that race is a big part of our history. There are a couple books that I wanted to recommend to you. These are, um, these are books that were actually uh, suggested to me by Ethan Hardin. And, uh, and so I wanted, wanted to pass them along to you as well. And so there's The Color of Compromise by Jamar Tisby. And then the other title is Unsettling Truths by Mark Charles and Soong Chan Ra. And each of these books represents or presents the ways in which the church has been complicit in the challenges people of color faced in the past and even today. And I think that that's something that we need to dive into as well. If we are going to be leading the way as the church in these conversations and these movements away from racial divide, we need to be well versed in what people um, are writing and saying about history. And again, from perspectives that are different from our own. Again, you do not have to agree with the presuppositions or his historical assessments in these books to gain helpful insight from them. In fact, a lot of times I think that when we read something that we disagree with, it either helps us understand why we believe what we believe or it opens up the door to believing something uh, different or greater than maybe what we were limited to understanding ourselves. And I think we need to come to the realiz realization that history is not without its flaws, its biases, its injustices, and even its racism. And it is not infallible. History is not infallible because it is always told from a certain point of view, a certain perspective. And with it comes a limited point of view or a limited perspective. Unless we do the work of reading and studying and learning kind of a well-rounded perspective of history from all points of view and from all perspectives. 
And when we study history with an open mind and with an open heart and with compassion and empathy, I think we can see the present with a sharpening clarity. It doesn't have to scare us. In fact, it, I think, actually will inspire us to something greater. In Romans chapter 5 through 7, the Apostle Paul argues that from a certain point of view, human sin and death are a corporate problem rather than an individual one. He tells us that one man's sin, Adam, brought guilt to all people and that sin entered the world because one man sinned and death became death came because of sin. And so we need to understand and recognize something that I oftentimes bristle at and it's this idea of generational sin. Now, I, I don't know what you've heard about that. I don't know what that term might um, elicit in your mind or, or in your heart. I know for me, it can oftentimes make the hair on the back of my neck stand up because I've always felt, why should I be held accountable for other people's mistakes? I'm having a hard enough time as it is just trying to live my life well and trying to do more good than bad. But now you're telling me that I have to take on all of the sin that has come before me, all of the failings, all of the injustices. Now I'm a part of that as well. But I think what I've come to recognize and what I've come to appreciate in a lot of, way, uh, in a lot of ways is that that's what it means for us to be human. That we collectively carry the burden of Adam and Eve's decision together and we collectively carry the burden of every decision, evil decision that has been made ever since. And that can feel like a lot, that can feel overwhelming at times, but I think what it does is it actually opens us up to a greater truth. And it help, uh, helps us get beyond just our individual place in that and recognize kind of the greater good that we are a part of. And so you and I, we're in this together we're in this together. It, it doesn't pit us against somebody else and it doesn't pit them against us. We're in this together. And so that also means that only together can we work to move against this shared brokenness of racial divide and other brokenness. Once we come to the realization that generational sin is something that we need to collectively move against and that we need to collectively own in a lot of ways that is that is when we will start to be able to see progress when it comes to things like racial divide and so i want to go on to the next thing and that is lament i want us to think about what it means to renew lament when it comes to racial divide and in light of our complex history and the ongoing racial injustices that swirl all around us and we see, it seems like on the news every day, the next step is spiritual formation. And so how do we respond to the realities of these injustices? But one of the best ways that we can, um, that we can actually work towards lament is through a discipline of recognizing and understanding the other side of things and allowing ourselves to feel the pain and the bitterness and the despair of those who are the on the other side of this racial divide and we can cry out to god together as a shared humanity as opposed to again it being about race and the divide that is between us that divide is so much a part of this broken world, but how can we come together in lament, in this shared discipline that we are called to as followers of Christ? He taught us best what it means to lament. In Romans 12, 15, we're told to rejoice with those who rejoice and to mourn with those who mourn. It's a great reminder to us that, again, we are collectively sharing in this and so when a brother or a sister is feeling despair is mourning is you know just feeling the weight of something those of us 
who are brothers and sisters with them in Christ, we can come alongside them and we can share in that tragedy with them. We can share in that despair with them and we can do so through lament. And when we do that, I have no doubt that what will come as a result of it is a solidarity to bring about kingdom healing and action. So here's a, a book recommendation that Mark broke up has laid out how lamentation opens doors for reconciliation. And God may well use this brokenness of racial divide to stir churches towards solidarity. Again, I don't think it's something that we should be afraid of, and it's not something that we should fall back from or that we should shrink from. Instead, I think as leaders, as a part of the church, and recognizing our role in this, I think you and I can lead in a way forward. And we can do so through love and through compassion and through lament. Again, for an introductory read, there's a helpful blog post by Mark Brokop. It's called Learning Empathy. And I'll include that in um, the description on our YouTube channel so that you can find that easily. Lastly, I like to renew listening. I like for us to talk about that. Again, I know as a white pastor that I have a great responsibility to raise the visibility of the voices that need to be heard. I have a great responsibility to bring in and to trumpet the voices of those who are marginalized, those who find themselves on the fringes, those who feel they have been oppressed or have been pushed out or are on the outside looking in. Again, Christ has shown us so many times throughout Scripture how He is on the side of the oppressed and the downtrodden. He has very little patience for those who are self-righteous and those who are religious zealots who are constantly trying to point out how somebody is out versus allowing somebody in. I think so often we are looking for ways to disqualify people as opposed to qualifying one another based on the fact that we're all, we're all human and we're all made in the image of God. Did you know that there are vibrant faith communities across the country filled with immigrants and people of color that are growing in amazing ways? Do you know of any? Have you visited any? Have you tried to become a part of any? Reconciliation involves intent listening and seeking the guidance of our brothers and sisters of color. I once heard something that helped me understand what it means to be a good listener, and it has much to do with our posture. There is listening to respond, which many of us are prone to do, especially in situations that are emotionally charged or if we feel like our beliefs are being questioned, this idea of listening to respond. Our posture is to respond and to defend ourselves quickly and adamantly and aggressively sometimes. And yet there is a way for us to listen that is more inviting and more accepting. It's called listening to learn. And maybe you've heard that term before, but we're not interested in arguing or debating we're simply taking in what the other person has to say without judgment or condemnation. And we may not agree with what is being said, but we value the person who is saying it because they are made in the image of God. They too are precious to our Father in heaven. You've probably heard this often quoted verse from the book of James, and it's just a good reminder for us. James 1.19, my dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. And I think especially now, in the times that we find ourselves in where it seems like everyone has an opinion to share, everyone is shouting from the rooftops, <laughs> Everyone is making claims about this thing or that. Everyone has information to share. I think especially now 
We should be listening to the voices that need to be heard, the ones that are oftentimes pushed out or the ones that are kept at arm's length. We need to allow ourselves to listen. We need to remove the pride that so often gets in the way of us being able to hear things that are that are critiques, that are uh, maybe difficult to hear, but are needed to be heard heard and to be understood and to be embraced. More book recommendations. The Next Evangelicalism by Sung Chan Ra and then Living in Color by Randy Woodley. Again, you don't have to agree what, with everything that are in these books, but I have no doubt that you will walk away with some sort of insight that will help you in your understanding of the racial divide that we find ourselves in these days. Again, we need to have people of color to have voices in the national and the global church. Too, too often and for too long, people of color have not been able to have the voice that they deserve. And not only that, but if we truly are a church family, if we are a family of brothers and sisters, it should just come with us valuing and adoring and looking out for one another that all people would have a voice and would have a voice that is valued and that is, uh, that is shared and that is embraced and celebrated. But again, I think that it has predominantly been people of color who have been pushed to the sidelines and we need for that to stop. They are an essential part of the body and they have been marginalized for too long. And so that is it. It certainly isn't everything. I wish I could share so much more. There's a lot of things that are swirling and percolating in my mind, in my heart when it comes to this topic, but it is something that I believe we should continue to keep front and center that we should keep at the top of our minds that we should continue to be attentive to. I don't want to slip back into the normal that was allowing for racial divide to continue to grow and fester. I want us to move forward and I want this to be a catalyst for it where we're able to have these hard conversations that lead us to actively moving against racism not just being against racism, but actively moving against it and finding ways that we can do so in our, in our schools, in our churches, in our towns, in our families, wherever it is that you have influence. And so may we renew our relationship to history in an effort to grow our humility and our understanding of what responsibility we have. And may we renew our practice of lament in an effort to increase our solidarity and unity. And may we renew our discipline of listening in an effort to further our togetherness. If the norms of the season behind us were racial division, suspicion, and polarity, may we find a renewed norm of proactive and humbled togetherness. Ultimately, this is God's aim, and that every tribe tongue and nation come to him in diverse unity as we read in Revelation. So let's live that heavenly reality out in the here and the now. So thank you for joining me today. Thank you for taking time to watch this study session. If you haven't done so already, would you mind clicking on the button below to subscribe? That way you'll be notified when new study sessions and new videos become available on our channel. As always, I don't take it for granted that you spent your time with us today, with me today, to learn and to study and to grow. I hope that this leads you into more growth and more understanding, that leads you into good conversations with other people. And so with that, blessings to you, and I look forward to seeing you at some point, and I hope you take care.